Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I would like to welcome you to module six of our neonatal nursing course. And today um, we're going to be talking about the renal system of the preterm neonates. And during this lecture, we will be discussing the embryology of the renal system and the challenges associated with the premature kidneys. We, we will also discuss pathophysiology of the acute renal injury uh, in the neonates. Furthermore, we will provide some details on how to optimize nursing care and family-centered care to ensure positive outcome for preterm infants. We have only three modules left in our neonatal nursing course. So we have module six, which is happening today. We also have module seven, uh, um, which is going to take place on uh, November 10th. And we're going to be talking about the endocrine system and the joint dismanagement. And as a final module, we're going to be talking about the uh, neuro neurological system. And in the final module um, that, that, that is going to take place on December 8th, we're going to be uh, discussing the um, fetal development and the functions affecting the brain development. So please, if you haven't registered for the upcoming modules, please do it now, either on our website or if you, if you would like, we can share further the uh, registration flyer. Um, I'm very glad to welcome you all today. For those of you who are coming back, thank you for staying with us um, during the last uh, seven months. Uh, we are very excited to have great participation. And um, today, unfortunately, we will not be doing any product demonstration, but Linda will make sure that we are covering all the um, theoretical aspects of the uh, renal system of the neonates. So um, today, I'm very grateful to have Ms. Linda Pretorius with us to deliver this lecture and to share her knowledge and her expertise in caring for preterm infants. Linda, the stage is yours. Today, we're talking about the renal system. And in, in actual fact, the neonatal renal system is um, part of the neonate that is probably not well done and not well cared for because a lot of the time we don't understand and a lot of the time we don't we're not actually aware of the importance of the renal system so today there will be a lot of discussion around um uh, sort of why we do things, how we do things, and when we do things. And um, today we will also be dis um, discussing medications as well. So let's start. Um, so the renal system basically eliminates the waste products from the body. It regulates the blood pH. It controls fluid balance um, if the the unit if the if the kidney is mature. And it maintains electrolytes and metabolites. And so the entire renal system consists of the kidneys, the ureter, the bladder, and the urethra. And within the kidneys, the nephrons are the main players. So it's very important to know this. Um, and it starts off as a very basic system in embryology. So when we look at embryology, the renal system arises out of the mesoderm where it will interact with the endoderm. So those of you who have attended the previous lectures, by now you would have realized that um, the, um, the mesoderm is basically where the muscle originates from in the body. And the endoderm is where the organs or the inner parts of the baby develops from. The ectoderm, which is usually on the outside, and you can see that, yeah, there's the ectoderm, is where the bones and those sort of structures are 
originate from. And what will happen as um, uh, fetal development happens is that the mesoderm will then flip over and cover the endoderm, Ach, the ectoderm. The endoderm is the, the inner layer of this, and that's mostly where the kidney originates from, a little bit from the mesoderm. And here we would be talking basically about the bladder because obviously the bladder is more muscular in nature. It starts developing from about week four and it may have some excretory function by week 11, but it is not complete until week 32. This is very, very important because for a long period in pregnancy, possibly up until about week 22, the placenta is the main kidney of the um, baby. And so the placenta does a lot of that work. And then as the kidney slowly develops more and more, it starts taking over that task. The bladder develops at about week four and the kidneys sit in the sacral area originally, right in the beginning in week four. So it sits on top of that ectoderm because that's where what the sacrum is. The kidneys receive between 2.5 and 4% of the cardiac output at birth and it will slowly over six weeks increase to 15 to 18% whereby in the adult your um, cardiac output to your kidneys is about 20 to 25%. This is a very very important concept because if we go back um, all the way to block one, where we started talking about the golden hour, what we do not realize is the importance of maintaining the blood pressure to keep the kidneys perfusing. Very, very often when we see renal failure, and um, but we'll come to that, when we see renal failure in the neonate, it is due to an initial insult, such as an acute drop in blood pressure, which has now become a problem. So this 2 to 4% up until the time the baby's born, and then it rapidly becomes more. In, in, in a baby of under a year, the, the kidney is perfusing at about 20%. Hypoperfusion and neurotoxicity affects the structures of the kidney dramatically during the third and fourth trimesters. And this is very, very important because very often the babies will drop their blood pressures. And on top of that, we will now add an antibiotic and then we do what we call is a double insult and the baby goes into renal failure. Should the baby suffer from interine growth utero retardation, it is likely that the blood supply to the kidneys is suboptimal. And very often in these tiny sort of five to 700 gram, 26 weekers, they are actually born in what we call high output failure. And we will talk about that quite extensively as we go along. Most preemies, are malnourished because very there's three reasons why a baby is premature. There's a problem with the mother, there's a problem with the placenta, there's a problem with the baby. Very often if the mother, such as um, uh, pregnancy-induced hypertension or the placenta is starting to fail, the baby is not being optimally fed. And so these babies are born with what we call IUGR, interuterine growth retardation. And these kidneys, these babies are malnourished. They've got a low protein count that affects their growth and it affects the number of nephrons on the kidney. Nephrogenesis only occurs at about 34 weeks of gestation. So your baby lying in that incubator at this time that's under 34 weeks of gestation has a very immature kidney that is trying to cope. Due to prematurity and the pressure put on the kidneys, the preemie is likely to be born in high output failure. And the reason for this is 
that the nephron is unable to concentrate the urine. And so the baby, there used to be um, this analogy that was put up many years ago that you could give perusamide to a brick and it wouldn't produce urine. But if you gave perusamide to a baby, never mind how dry it was, it would produce urine <coughs> detrimentally. So if we were to look here, if you've got placental insufficiency, you've got a decreased blood flow. There's cerebral redistribution, there's decreased protein delivery, decreased oxygen delivery, which leads to growth in uh, retardation. What you must remember is that because of this cerebral redistribution, in most instances, growth retardation will be brain sparing, but it is to the detriment of other organs. So now there is this developmental disruption which occurs in the kidney. You get hyperperfusion, there's very little nephron, you get morphologic changes and you get nephrotoxicity deliver, de happening and very easily this low birth weight baby goes into renal failure or is in renal failure. The younger the preemie, the more likely the chance of developing chronic renal failure. As the preemie grows, this situation will improve in most instances. So if you say to me, well, Linda, what is high output failure? I'll explain it to you like this. Um, there have been um, dramatic changes over the past sort of 15 to 15, in the last five to 15 years. The use of a hybrid incubator has reduced the damage that occurs here quite significantly because what they've done is they've put humidity into that incubator. And because the baby's skin is so thin and because the kidney is not working, fluid loss is very high in the microprem. So what happens is once we've placed the baby in the hybrid incubator, we play with the actual um, humidity till the baby keratinizes at about 14 days, which stops this huge, what we call inaccessible loss through the skin. And by maintaining this a similar humidity on the outside as what is in the inside, we are reducing fluid loss. And with that, we are reducing um, electrolyte loss. And that way we can support the kidney better. So due to the permeability of the skin, the fluid loss is high and the baby may develop dehydration and hypo or hypernatremia. One of the big problems that will occur with these babies and where you will see it first is, is if you do really a very careful intake and output, you will see that these babies pass more than one mil per kilo per hour of, of urine. And the other thing that you will notice is that the baby over a period of 12 to 24 to 36 hours, the heart rate creeps up. That is a sign that the heart is having to work harder because perhaps the fluid it's pumping is not as available as it was when the baby was born. Immature kidneys have been linked to the development of bronchopulmonary dysplasia or BPD, metabolic acidosis and poor growth in NICU. The preemie has an inability to concentrate its urine and therefore um, it just keeps passing urine. Because of the baby being born preemie, the epigenetics of the kidney are affected. What are the epigenetics? So in many instances, on our genes, we actually have the ability that if it is stimulated in a specific way for it either to optimize or to undermine, if you can say that, so not to optimize the, the genetics to that body, so keeping you healthy. 
One of the problems with a premature kidney is that epigenetically, it now starts programming this child to actually have poor kidney function. Epigenetics are affected by inflammation, sepsis, and hypoxia. And this includes the term baby born in our units. If we talk inflammation, we're talking about the septic baby that is born in our units. That baby born with group B strep, um, the baby born because mommy had a, a UTI and now the baby is septic. Um, the baby born with HIE, um, those babies hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, they are also prone because that kidney is not fully developed at birth either. They are also prone to developing acute renal failure or acute kidney failure. If you want to go and look up about acute um, renal failure, rather look under AKI, acute kidney um, injuries, and that will tell you about what the failure will do. So very often these children will take a long time to repair or to improve their kidney function. Sepsis and, and, and ischemia further um, causes a compromise of the kidney function. The sepsis, because of the breakdown of, of, of product, of, sept, of, of the bacteria, that can be. And it's in ischemia, we actually have necrosis as deep as on the kidney bed. TPN, or um, total parental nutrition, oxygen radicals, medications, and hypotension also play a role. Giving TPN does stress the kidney. Oxygen-free radicals do stress the kidney, and you will see in the latest literature, and next month we are covering jaundice, um, there, there is a fair amount of play to say that leaving the jaundice level a little bit higher is actually beneficial because it will gobble these oxygen radicals. Hypertension plays a huge role because once you lose perfusion to your kidney, irrespective of age, you will go into renal um, failure. So very often if, for instance, we have major trauma and the patient has suffered blood loss on the side of the road, or they come in, those patients will suffer renal failure. If there's been hypotension due to sepsis, those patients also are likely to start developing renal failure. So what happens with the premature kidney? Due to the permeability of the skin of the micropremia in the first 24, in the first 14 days of life, one finds that the inaccessible water loss is high. This leads to sodium and fluid loss. The baby continues to produce urine of more than one mole per kilo per hour. Now, some of you may ask me, how do we calculate that? So you, you have to measure the urine. There are various ways of measuring urine. You can place a catheter if you are skilled enough. Very often in South Africa, we actually utilize umbilical catheters to place as urinary catheters because they're small and they don't do much. They, there's far chance, less chance of harm. Or perhaps you can weigh um, the nappy before you put it in, the diaper, and then weigh the diaper afterwards, and you subtract the the weight of the diaper and that will give you a volume. It's not very accurate, but it will give you an idea. Or in some instances, they will place um, a urine specimen bag over the genitalia to gather it. They often leak, so they're not accurate. People have tried cotton wool and um, actually using a syringe to withdraw the urine from the cotton wool. Again, you're probably losing one or two moles, but you will tally up your urine output. You will tally, tally up how many hours. So say I've collected the urine for eight hours. I will take my volume of urine, divide it by the eight hours, and divide it by the baby's weight. So it would read something like 
40 divided by 8 divided by 0.530 because the baby weighs 530 grams. And that will give you the moles per kilo per hour that the baby is passing. If you know that that is the moles per kilo per hour that the baby is passing, you can now tell the doctor, well, I think we are behind on fluid and we need to up our fluid intake to actually get it to, um, to, 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 to catch up. The baby will be at risk of metabolic and or renal disease. As I said, the hybrid incubators utilize humidification to help with this, especially if you have a good understanding of your hybrid incubator, you will prevent a lot of this loss initially. It is very common to see this in the first three to four days of life. In many um, developing countries, we do not have hybrid incubators and there's the use of putting um, serin wrap or what we term glad wrap over the open incubator or resuscitator to try and prevent this. It is not very successful and you will still be monitoring what we would call a urea and, um, and electrolytes um, test every day to make sure this baby is okay. Lasix and caffeine can further worsen the situation. Lasix is the, um, is the product name. The generic name is ferrucemide. We will be discussing that as well. So there is this, um, uh, this very important move to give caffeine as early as possible, but we have to be aware that we must know what is happening with the renal function. The premature epidermis is very thin, not completely formed, has very few corneified layers, and that's why it leaks fluid. So not only can the kidney not concentrate the urine, but because the baby is not keratinized, there's a loss of fluid across um, the skin. And this is when the baby then runs into a lot of, a lot of, it runs into trouble. It takes the body about 14 days to keratinize, irrespective of the age of gestation and weight. So for 14 days, we will keep that child in humidity and we will slowly wean it. And here I'm talking about the babies between, well, it depends on what you resuscitate in your hospital, but um, from 26 weeks to 32 weeks, but in many hospitals are now resuscitating babies as far down as um, 22 weeks two weeks. So these babies will need a period of time to keratinize and they need that optimal use of humidification for at least 14 days. The skin allows for absorption and this is very, very important. If you are to put anything on that skin, there is a chance that it can cause toxicity. Um, so you've got to be, you can work it in your favor or it can work against you. Um, one of the um, ways of getting up a baby's zinc level is to put zinc oxide onto the skin and it's automatically absorbed there um, and, and will help the baby. Zinc on its own helps fight infections. I'm not saying that you must go and lather your babies in zinc oxide. Please don't do that. But just using it on the buttock area, there will be absorption of zinc. Um, in burns patients, we have learned that because their upper skin has been removed, because they've had burns, if they stay in the tea tree oil dressings too long, they become toxic from that. At the same level, they can become toxic as well as if we... If, is if we um, utilize too much povidine iodine as well, there is a toxicity described there. It's a similar um, concept because if you've been burnt, your skin is also very permeable. So that, that is why the hybrid incubators are being used. 
Careful monitoring of the intake and output is essential. Um, we do like to use what we term a buretrol so that we know how much fluid is running in. And in most instances now, an electrical uh, uh, an electric pump which controls it. There you can see a picture of that, which will be set at a prescribed rate by your doctor to say this is how many moles per hour must be given to the baby. It is important that you test the urine at least once a shift for specific gravity, for glucose, for protein, and for blood because this will tell you a fair amount about what your um, renal function is about. Um, so here we are talking the, the specific gravity usually runs between um, 1000 to 1010. If there is glucose spillage, that needs to be reported to the pediatrician because if you've got glucose spillage on the kidney, you will have a high glucose reading in the baby and it might be necessary to start what we call a trickle of insulin. Um, protein is very often spilling across and if there's blood, we also need to um, comment on that. Catheters or nappy weighing is essential. Fluid selection and replacement is essential. Very often the doctors would have a cocktail they would prescribe, which you would have to draw up and look at and play with very carefully. Um, early feeding does relieve um, the protein loss and here especially colostrum or breast milk from the mother is most important. I have told you how to calculate um, the total output and if you if you are managing your environment and your fluid balance correctly, your premie, your prem baby should be passing between 0.5 to 1 moles of urine per hour, and the same with your term baby. So if we are going to look at acute renal injury in neonates, please remember that this includes both the term and the prem baby. This is a reversible situation of the accumulative levels of creatinine with or without the reduction of urine output. What very often happens to severely septic babies, <clears throat> to babies that have had very bad hypoxic episodes, and to premies is that they can become severely odematous. They become severely odematous. And this will they, they, they literally can blow up overnight. They suddenly become um, swollen. They, they, they almost glisten. And when you touch that, it is what we call pitting edema. So when you push down, your finger's imprint will stay there. This is a nursing nightmare, and we will cover it a bit later. A rise... A rising level of creatinine affects the morbidity and the mortality of the baby. Because once you start getting major renal failure, another organ will fairly quickly join the party. Generally, it could be the liver, it could be the lungs. Acute renal injury has a high incidence, especially in the micropreme, but often goes undetected. So they will have this acute renal injury, but they sort of recover, they go home, and then later on these children start presenting, coming back to us in renal failure. Consequence to the lung and the brain are visible early on. However, kidney damage is less evident. So early on, we can see that the lung is starting to develop BPD, become hard, difficult to ventilate in the lung we will uh, in the brain we will see um, bleeds which will become peri um, ventricular um, leukomalacia those those injuries we will see early on however kidney function can be quite um, confusing and not easily noticed or picked up Hyperperfusion is common in the newborn kidney, as I've said, and this is accompanied by high renal vascular resistance and a decrease of sodium absorption. 
Um, and this is an important thing to remember that when the baby initially is born, there'll be sodium loss. When the kidney starts showing an injury, the sodium climbs. It is um, quite important that you monitor the baby's blood pressure on their mean blood pressure. And remember what the rule is, if you go back to the previous lectures, it's gestational age, current gestational age plus at least two. So if the baby is now 34 weeker, I want my mean blood pressure to be above 36. Reading the systolic diastolic is not as important as maintaining the mean blood pressure because that tells us what the perfusion is on the kidney floor. So the damage maybe is mild as just needing fluid replacement to complete renal failure which might require dialysis. In most instances peritoneal dialysis is used. Um, um, hemodialysis um, is only really done in big centers. Um, it can cause factors such as, it can be caused by, as I've said before, sepsis, hypervolemia, asphyxia, RDS, and cardiac failure. Um, and what you need to understand in most instances is that when a baby does develop renal failure, the doctors will try and drive those kidneys with medication. So very often they will utilize the use of albumin, and usually about 4%, which they put up as a continuous infusion. They will then add ferrucemide to try and mobilize because the fluid has gone and sat in third space. What is third space? So if we consider that you've got circulatory volume, there's blood pumping through your body, and in that there's fluid and there's, well, there's water and there's um, electrolytes. When the blood, when the capillary meets up against the cell wall, there is diffusion that occurs between the cell wall and the capillary bed of various um, electrolytes, and fluid and glucose. But when a child goes into renal failure, what happens is that a, a level of fluid develops between the cell wall and the capillary wall. So now there's a, a, almost a thickening that has occurred there, which prevents the body or, or prevents that optimal movement of oxygen, um, the movement of electrolytes, of glucose, of water. So it's very important that the doctors then will start you, the use of albumin. Um, in older centers, they use a lot of aminophilin. They will use Lasix to drive this. And they can use the inotropes as well to maintain the blood pressure, to optimize the urine output, to get this fluid off the body. Initially, when the babies become swollen, your urine output would decrease. When the kidney starts functioning again or sort of semi-recuperating, there will be this dramatic loss of fluid. Nephrotoxic drugs such as dexamethasone, cortisone, ferrucemide, theophylin, and aminoglycosides can cause damage on the kidney as well. Your big amino glycoside here would be amikacin or gentamicin. So let's talk hyponatremia. Hyponatremia is a sodium level of 132 milliequivalents per liter on the blood serum. It occurs in about 30% of the neonatal ICU patients. It is associated with poor growth. Very often, after a hyponatremic episode, your babies will battle to gain weight. They can also develop seizures if it goes below 132. It does not need to go too low below that for the child to develop seizures. 
It has poor neurological outcomes. It can lead to bleeding in the brain. It causes nausea, vomiting, hypothermia, weakness, seizures, and coma. Now, just look at that. And let's talk this. Nausea and vomiting. These are the first two signs. Very often, when a baby doesn't tolerate its feed, could this be the problem? Have you checked the sodium level? It's usually caused by excessive fluid loss due to an immature renal system or GIT or right in the beginning when the baby is born and it's a micropremie and it doesn't get placed into a hybrid incubator. It's usually present in the low gestational age babies when there's RDS, respiratory distress syndrome, when we have given medications such as dexamethasone, and sometimes breast milk is low in sodium, so the baby's going to battle to maintain its sodium if we have fluid loss. So here you can see it attacks the, the glial cells in the brain and the astrocytes in the brain. It affects the kidney on this level, and the epidermal <clears throat> cells will contribute to it as well. So it's very important that you become very aware how fluid loss can affect these babies. So sodium deficiency will raise the morbidity significantly. There's poor neurological outcome. Cerebral palsy has been linked to it. Intracranial hemorrhages have been linked to it. Guys, this is becoming a very important buzzword within um, the neonatal development um, community. Cerebral palsy is linked to hyponatremia and so is intracranial hemorrhages. However, the um, Canadians are starting to show that early intervention programs will help with this, but we need to be aware of this. And that is why monitoring these babies post hyponatremia is so important. They do need a cranial sonar. Sensory neural hearing loss often occurs. And this specifically occurs with your um, amikacin medication and there's constant poor growth. These babies stay small, they battle to gain weight. Sodium excretion is dependent on <clears throat> urine leaf flow rate, fluid selection and use, the circadian cycle. So basically at night there's less sodium loss, medication, and evidence shows that a sodium deficiency retards the growth in rat pups. And a similar picture is seen at, in preemies under 30, um, 28 weeks. Very often when we monitor the, the 24 to 28 weeker babies um, later on, we find very interesting trends happening. A lot of the little girls will fluid limit from about four months um, corrected to about eight months corrected. And these babies very often battle to get to the 10 kilogram um, mark. Once they get to the 10 kilogram mark, they tend to flourish, but it does take them a very long time. But a child that's had an acute kidney injury, AKI, may remain small for most, part, well, for their life. Important info here for babies with stomas. So when we are looking at our NEC baby that developed NEC early on because there was a resuscitation at birth, we got necrotic bowel, 48 hours later baby went to theater, comes back with a colostomy in place, the bowel, especially the colon, plays an important role in absorbing fluids and sodium. And not just the stoma baby, but the general microprem baby, it is important to track the excretion of meconium. Because 
If the bowel is functioning correctly, it will absorb the sodium. This means that babies with stomas are highly at risk of hyponatremia. This very often happens. And they also gain weight poorly. So it's important with stoma babies to try and keep your sodium levels between 135 and 145. <laughs> I've left you an article there that has recently been published that spoke about this. Here we are talking especially on our micro premies in the early weeks of, of, of um, being born. So please go and look at the article and um, see where you are there. Now we come to the nursing care. It is important to remember that the renal system is as important as the nervous and the respiratory system. And we should not just assume, well, the baby passed urine and then people chart on the ICU chart, PU times one. What does that mean? If you have been giving sedation, such as morphine and dormicum, actually the bladder might be full and the baby isn't passing urine. And years ago, we were told to express the bladder. Well, that's now been shown not to be a good idea. It's rather better to get somebody who knows how to catheterize these babies to catheterize them and drain the urine. But remember, full bladder is also a problem because these babies, because especially with morphine, the little receptors that allow the bladder to empty become anesthetized. And so the bladder is sitting there. It becomes a source of infection, number one. But number two, it's getting fuller and fuller and fuller. So it becomes important that a 12-hourly urine test is done at least until the baby is stable and on full feeds. And then we can look at doing daily urine tests. Any abnormality needs to be rechecked and reported, such as glucose, blood, and nitrites. Nitrates, it's in South Africa on a urine stick, it's the purple um, nitrates. And um, it's important that um, we become aware of it because then we do need to send urine for culture. Carefully consider the fluids when mixing and adding medications such as dopamine. And what I mean here is that if your baby has got a high glucose reading on a glucose monitor and it's spilling glucose in its urine and the doctor now says, oh, well, I want you to mix this cocktail, it might be advisable to rather go to 5% dextrose instead of 10% dextrose because of the circulatory volume of dextrose or you may need to give insulin to actually shift that glucose. Here by the problem, that glucose of insulin given in some of our IV therapy giving sets can disappear into the wall of the giving set. And it is important that you check with the manufacturer that the wall of the giving set is not sensitive to insulin because it doesn't help to give the insulin if it's going to sit in the giving set and never get to the patient. Please monitor for edema, it's very important. Comment on it, turn that baby regularly. Ensure, for instance, if this baby was a dermatist, this would not be optimal because it would cause on a very thin piece of, of skin, really, nothing more, there's very little muscle there, it could cause a pressure area. Another pressure area that often in edema babies will develop is here, and especially on their backs, it is important to turn them regularly. The same as moving these de monitoring devices. You have to move them regularly, because what will happen is that they can very easily cause um, a sore underneath the monitoring device. Use mindful nappy changing. Be calm and be careful because remember that if you were to lift those little legs rapidly, you are going to improve 
the cardiac return rapidly. That is not a good idea because it is going to impact on the brain. So be calm and careful the way you change the nappy. So you need to be calm and clean. It must be a very positive experience for both baby and parent if, they please, if they're there. Change and check includes the skin, the position and the feeding. If they get a dermatist, very often the elastic of your diaper could actually cut in to the skin. Be careful of that. Be careful that there's not some residual left behind that can be a problem. If you're putting cotton wool at there to catch the fluid, make sure that you've got it in the right position. And little boys here are problematic, obviously, because of their twig and berries. Make sure that the baby, there's comfort. Make sure that these babies can sleep and be confident and close. It means that you may need to put um, a, a wrap or a blanket over the baby to give it a security and a bit of proprioception. It is very important that when you do clean the little boy, you check that, that everything is intact if they are very swollen. It's very, very important. One of the other big important things here is do not use too small or too big a nappy because you are forcing the leg in, into abduction or adduction and that can be problematic. Please be careful. When we talk family-centered care, ensure that the parents are involved. It is not nice to see this little baby that blows up and, and sits there like a big drop of water. Talk them through it, be careful, support them. Ensure parents know why there's a catheter or why you're weighing napkins. So that when they change it, because they are involved in family-centered care, they will keep the nappy for you to quickly weigh. Don't keep nappies and think I'm gonna weigh it in 15 or 20 minutes time because there will be evaporation. Allow the parents to do as much routine care as possible and educate them on how to clean the genitalia correctly from front to back. It is also very important that you allow for buckle feeding and nuzzling where possible. If the baby is severely ill, has gone into renal failures on a ventilator, it's still not an excuse not to allow mommy to hold that baby for a period of time. It will also help with the skin because your skin, that baby's skin, a lot of that helps a lot. What about infection control? In these babies with renal failure, antibiotics should only be given for as long as necessary. And this includes the antifungazoles that we are needing to give more and more. So it is important that you monitor and count your antibiotic days clearly on a chart. Ensure that you change the nappy area often as soon as possible. And do not, as I have said before, overuse topical ointments. Be careful with topical ointments. Um, zinc oxide is safe, but when you start using something that has an antibiotic to it or an antifungal to it, be careful if it's still a young baby because the skin will absorb it. And now we can go to any questions if there are are in question okay so we have a question now uh, the first question is newborn hypertension the map range and is newborn hypertension damaging to the kidneys hyper er or o on the end hyper er okay so hypertension in the newborn baby should be investigated because it could be, it often is related to a cardiac lesion, such as hmm, some of the cardiac lesions can do it. And so it is important that we check the hypertension. But before you go and say to a doctor, 
um, I've got a low, um, I, I, I have a problem with this. Please ensure, please ensure that you've not used the incorrect um, cuff because very often that's problematic. So the cuff needs to be two thirds of the limb that you are measuring it on. And when I say limb, if you're doing the upper arm from the shoulder to the elbow, if you're doing the, the leg, it needs to be from the knee to the ankle. So very often hypertension could be a problem with the actual um, cuff. Just exclude that. Excellent, thank you. There is another question. Thank you, Linda. What is the correct start dose of gentamicin um, in preterm? Sure. The correct dose are. Can you repeat it, Margarita? What is the correct start dose of gentamicin in preterm? Oh. Three terms. Um, I'll have to look it up for you quickly. It's one of those I don't carry around in my head, and I'll I'll tell you after the break. But it does need you do need to look at renal function. As I, I somehow I've got a, a, the number ten in my head, but let me just check it, and I'll come back to you um, after the break. Excellent. Thank you. Um, there is another question. What kind of skin lotions? can be used on micropremies receiving humidity? So, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you it this way. For me, the most um, successful lotion to use on the preterms early on is actually using MCT oil medium chain triglyceride and those of you that work in the big units will know about mct we often add it to the um, feed to get the baby to gain weight it is just as well absorbed on the skin and um, anecdotally i'm not saying this is proven because it's not in my group of prem babies not one of the babies rubbed with mct oil has developed eczema long term. Great, thank you so much, Linda, for your feedback. Um, do we have any more questions? If you have questions, please type them in into the question chat box and um, we can answer them now. Or we can take a five minute break for, for those of you to get some coffee. And uh, okay, there's one more question, Linda, just for you. How do we assess renal function in preemies and neonates? You would have to um, do a UNE and also um, ask for glomerular function um, at the end. You know, they can do a, a, a GFR and check the, the, the glomerular um, flow rate and that will tell you. So if you're all calm and you're all happy, um, I'm just waiting for the clinical pharmacist to send me back the dose. But before we get there, I, I, I do need to um, address um, a very important part of where we are with regards to prematurity. So next um, in November, we will be doing the endocrine block and we will cover it there again. But the question about hypertension has come up and the whole idea of these babies failing to thrive, so battling to gain weight. Um, we are starting to see um, a lot of adult preemies. Um, they, they, there's quite a big cohort now in their 20s, a fairly big one in their 30s. And um, we are now starting to see that physicians are specializing in premature care for adults because one of the problems that will originate from acute renal failure, 
from these children and their endocrine um, issues, especially their endocrine issues, is that they will develop fat around their organs. And that is problematic because what has happened, and I will make sure in next month's um, uh, lecture that we've got a link, is that we are now seeing that when these babies are, are scanned on discharge home, they may appear thin, they may be thin, but actually there's already fat around their organs. And for those of you that have done intensive care or um, have, have read a lot, you will know the significance of fat around especially the kidney, the liver and the heart. It leads to hypertension, type 2 diabetes, that sort of thing. And a lot of that can be described back to this acute kidney injury and the problems with the endocrine system um, at birth. So it's very, very important that we look at it and that we have a good idea where we are with regards to it. As soon as um, she's come back to me and I've got the correct dose, I'll give it to you. But let's talk about dexamethasone. So dexamethasone belongs to the class of corticosteroids. Now, those of you that have been following um, the lecture series, um, every lecture, you all know that it is um, a problem um, it is a problem that the babies secrete cortisol. Cortisol is a natural cortisone, which is um, secreted by the brain during flight and fright. Dexamethasone itself is a, is a type of cortisone, which if it is given early on to these children, can actually cause blood changes. So it inhibits the immune system, preventing inflammation and swelling. It's used very successfully to prevent BPD, but it has found to have an effect on the neurodevelopmental system, and it also has worsened the development of SIP. Remember last month we spoke about um, SIP, which is that spontaneous intestinal perforation that occurs. It looks like NEC. If people aren't aware, they will discuss it as NEC, but it's not. It usually sits in the colon part of the um, bowel. Betamethasone, which is also a cortisone, is used successfully prior to it, prior to the baby being born, um, to mature the lungs and has not shown has actually been shown to be possibly brain protecting when given to the, the baby beforehand. <coughs> so betamethasone in South Africa is known as celestamine, um, just so that you know. So for the person who asked the dose of gentamicin, so if the baby is less than a week old, it's six milligrams per kilogram per day in two doses um, and, and that's the way you would calculate it. So it would be given in two doses. When I ran the neonatal unit at Garden City, I used to insist that they, the babies first passed urine before giving the amikacin or the um, gentamicin because that tells us there is renal function and then when you give the drug, it's not so bad. But you can get a renal agenesis that goes undetected or a single kidney. And if you give medication on top of that, you're going to have problems. So just be careful with both of them. The baby must have passed urine. Dexamethasone side effects are hypoglycemia, and it happens quite quickly, reflux insomnia, weight gain, especially fluid retention, hyponatremia because of fluid retention, and further hypoxic episodes. 
So it should be given in caution with caution in the HIE patient. Be very careful of dexamethasone. Also be careful where you give it. Try and give it higher up in your IV solution. What precautions should you do? Exclude sepsis, especially fungus sepsis. That's very, very important. Check for kidney disease, check for liver disease, check for hypertension because it can worsen it. And if there's a history of fractures or your babies haven't been receiving vitamin D, be careful of giving dexamethasone because it can be problematic. So that, that in itself is very, very important. Um, and be aware of your, um, your medications and how you give it. So dexamethasone, a cortisone, we're very careful with it. We try not to give it to the babies because of the effect on the neurodevelopmental side. What are the possible drug interactions? Indomethazine or ibuprofen, it can interact with and cause the blood cascade. Kefotraxone, also a problem. And give it in the maintenance fluid high up at the Y connection. If it is used to prevent um, BPD, it should rather be given as an inhaled solution. So um, here we would use something like bedesonide so that it works on the lung um, locally. Caffeine. Caffeine is a central nervous system stimulant. It's used exclusively in premature infants for apnea. So we're actually using the side effect of caffeine to, to treat apnea. Remember that when a baby has an apneic episode, what will happen? The baby stops breathing, the heart rate drops. At the same time, what's going to drop? your blood pressure. When the heart rate and the blood pressure drop, you're going to get poor kidney function. So it all works together. By, by preventing apnea, we maintain the blood pressure better and we are able to re retain the renal function better. It has been shown to improve neurodevelopment and respiratory outcomes. The reason for this is, I think, because we maintain a more equal cerebral perfusion and that because there's no apneas involved, the lungs also have a more um, sort of, um, uh, 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 the, the, the lungs have perfusion pressure, which is equaling and, and stable. And once you have those two stable effects on the brain and the uh, and the lung, you 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 do far less harm. There's far less chance of damage. It's also thought to have a protective element against BPD and a PDA. The PDA is because if you have apneas, you will remember when we did the PDA, we spoke about that PDA being closed by pressures. The minute a child has an apnea, the heart rate drops. So you're going to get changes in pressures in the lung, changes in pressures in the cardiac system. So it's going to affect your baby's breathing. It's going to affect the heart rate. It's going to affect the kidney. At five years of age, it has been so what they've done is the kids that got their caffeine early on were tested at five years of age and we saw an improved gross motor function and coordination. So these babies did better because they had this constant stable blood flow maintaining the pressures everywhere. Um, if you have seen apnea as well, you will um, also realize that very often there's a startle reflex that goes with it. In the most recent developmental care literature, we are now starting to see this discussion around retained reflexes and the effect they have on the baby's developmental growth. And very often these retained reflexes will improve, will 
will impact on your gross motor function. So they will later on appear as though they've got ADHD, but many of them have these retained primitive reflexes. So what is the action of caffeine? It stimulates the respiratory center in the medulla. It sensitizes the center to CO2. So the um, respiratory center in the medulla measures the CO2, and that's what makes you take a deep breath in and out. It gives improved muscle tone, and so therefore gross motor development. It enhances diaphragmatic contractility. It increases metabolism and it increases oxygen consumption. What are the actions? It has a diuretic effect. So, you know, those of you who live on coffee during your day, working your shift, know exactly what that problem is. It alters your glucose hemostasis. It can act as an anti-inflammatory on the lung. One of the biggest reasons for starting it early, it can reduce the time on the ventilator. It is as effective orally as IV, and it reaches plasma levels very quickly. It does not cause fluctuations in cerebral blood flow. This is very important because fluctuations in cerebral blood flow will lead to intraventricular hemorrhages and periventricular leukomalacia. Its action, as I said, it has a diuretic effect, it um, alters glucose hemostasis, it's anti-inflammatory, and it reduces time on the ventilator. It's important to note that caffeine is partially metabolized by the liver. It's eliminated by the kidneys, so you could get a raised caffeine level if your kidneys aren't working. It should be commenced within three days of following birth, and it should be disconnected, uh, discontinued at 40 weeks, as it can. Um, yeah, so that, that's what needs to happen. What are the side effects? Well, tachycardia is its biggest side effect. And please be careful if you're giving it IV. Once again, give it at the Y connection so it can slowly infuse into the baby. Tachypnea, so breathing fast, they can be agitated and that will worsen their startle reflex. They can be very irritable, they can be a tremor, they can be hypotonia, and you could see tonic clonic movements. That is this jerky motion that you very often see. What does it interact with? Adrenaline and caffeine together will improve the heart rate significantly. It affects how ciprofloxacillin is metabolized. It can block the um, sedative effect of sodium gardenol, um, uh, which is um, IV phenobarbitone. Fluconazole prevents the metabolism of caffeine and we may re be required to reduce the dose. So if your baby has been on TPN long term, now has had to have fluconazole, fluconazole because the baby has, has started showing signs of a candida sepsis, you have to keep monitoring your caffeine levels because you may have to reduce the dose because it would accumulate. <clears throat> amino glycosides, here we are talking about your um, amikacin, your gentamicin. It's a, it's a class of antibiotics used to treat gram-negative bacteria. And in babies, it is what we call imperative care or first-line care. We often start it right at the beginning. Its action is to stop the bacteria from producing the proteins it needs. It's usually... Oh, it's usually given IV in, um, and it can be given in eye drop form, ear drop form, or as an uh, ointment. It can be very nephrotoxic. Is everything all right, Margarita?
It can be very nephrotoxic. It can actually lead to renal failure. It can lead to hearing loss and vestibular disturbances. And this is very, very important. Because if your amikacin level becomes toxic, these babies become quite irritable and disorganized in their, in their incubators. And it should never be given longer than two weeks. The, tip, the typical aminoglycosides we use would be amikacin, gentamicin, tobramycin. Canamycin is not used extensively in neonatology, but is used in pediatrics, just so that you know. What are the adverse effects? You can have renal toxicity, as we said, vestibular and auditory toxicity. It prolongs the effect of neuroblockers. So here we are talking about your rockeroniums, your susks, um, all of those that you may use in your babies that have um, come in with HIE or severe respiratory distress that you are ventilating and now neuroblocking. We don't neuroblock as much as we did because it does lead to fluid retention anyway. But if an aminoglycoside is given with one of them, like um, Pavilon, it could be problematic. The levels need to be checked after the third dose at least and should be given higher up in your giving set. So at least at the second Y connection so that it can slowly um, infuse into the baby. So this is just what it speaks about. It's against um, gram-negative anaerobes. It's mainly bactericidal. It inhibits the protein synthesis. It's nephrotoxic and ototoxic, which is ears. The tang is tobramycin, amikacin, neomycin, gentamicin, and streptomycin. Streptomycin is not a drug that we see anymore. It's a drug that is used extensively in the veterinary world. Nano, which is the effects of aminoglycosides, neurotoxicity, allergies, nephrotoxicity, and ototoxicity. So please just remember that. Ferrucamide, which um, its common uh, market name is Lasix. Um, this is a diuretic to try and reduce or to allow the baby to pass urine. It's, it's an attempt to reduce the extra fluid, which I said was third space, intra and extracellularly. It's a diuretic that works on the loop of Henle. It can reduce the blood pressure. And the side effect of it is that you lose sodium and potassium. Now, one of the big things that you must realize about ferrucamide is that it can lead to deafness if it is given too fast. Mostly transient, but there are cases where children have remained deaf. The indications for ferrucamide is fluid overload, congestive cardiac failure or CCF, acute renal insufficiency, so to try and drive that kidney, chronic lung disease because the doctors like to keep the lung dry and to reduce as sodium if the baby has a very high sodium because just like they can have seizures in low sodium, they will seizure with high sodium as well. We will cover the hypernatremia or high sodium um, in the uh, neuro block. So the, the last block, the block in December. What are the side effects of ferrucamide? There's lightheadedness, there's a headache, they can dehydrate, they can have severe muscle cramps, often because they lose magnesium as well. There's a weakness. These babies often, once they've had Ferrucamide don't feed well. There's confusion. They can be drowsy and they can develop a tachypnea, tachycardia. The precautions, 
be aware of your renal function and your renal perfusion. You cannot give um, Lasix to a baby with a low blood pressure. You're going to damage the kidneys. <clears throat> be careful with liver issues. Hypokalemia can um, occur and is rapid, and that is problematic because it can lead to cardiac arrest. And it very often interacts with ibuprofen. Now, um, very often we used to go through a period of time where when we treated adductus arteriosus medically, we used ibuprofen, many places still do, and then they give um, uh, verusamide as well to reduce the circulatory volume to try and attempt to reduce the pressures and get that duct to close. But there can be an interaction between them. Here are the suggested readings that we have for you on various articles. And then it is just to say that we need to understand the embryology, what the premature kidney does, how acute renal failure um, affects the neonate. It is not just the preemie. What hyponatremia is about, what the nursing care should be, and what the medication should be. Are there any questions following this? Thank you, Linda, for um, this very detailed presentation. So now we would like to open the floor again for your questions. So if you do get any questions, please type them in into the question box so that we can answer them in this session. So far, we haven't seen any questions, uh, but I'm sure um, people are just typing in their questions currently as we speak. So um, uh, once again, um, this webinar was obviously dedicated to the renal system of the preterm neonates. And in the next modules, we are going to cover um, the um, we're going to cover on uh, November 10th the endocrine system. So basically, we're going to talk about the endocrine disorders in the neonatal ICU. And our final webinar is then um, going to take place on December 8th. Uh, and we're gonna, going to talk about the uh, neurological system and uh, potential brain injuries. Um, so, for those of you who have dialed in today, the recording of the webinar will be available after the webinar and we will share the recording um, via YouTube and you'd be able to review all the materials after the webinar. If you have missed previous webinars, you can also check those webinar recordings on YouTube. Uh, and you can also register on our website to download the uh, presentations. So far, I'm not seeing any more new questions. So, Marguerite, yeah. Can we just chat around um, International Premi Day, which is on the 17th of November? and that Draga will be having their webinar on the 18th of November, um, which is, it, it's open for people to join. The first part will be developmental care. The second part will be the golden hour in intensive care, as well as um, the U, uh, uh, Dr. Khalid speaking from the UAE, on um, how they have dealt with COVID. Um, it's a free webinar, and um, I think there, there are links on, on your website, aren't there, Margarita? Yes, that's correct. There are links on our website, and we will also link the uh, registration page on our neonatal nursing course. We also do frequent um, communication via emails, um, with regards to this event. So if, if, if you don't receive emails from Draeger, please sign up on our neonatal nursing page. Thank you, Linda, for bringing this up. Yes, we are very excited 
to host the um, webinar or a series of webinars on the World Prematurity Date. It is scheduled for November 18th and it's going to take place from 9.45 until 2 p.m. Uh, of the Central African time. So for those of you who are interested, please dial in and register for the webinar. Excellent. We have received uh, a new question. Um, uh, if the neonate reaches the corrected gestational age of 34 weeks, weights above 1.5 kg, and with the SAS of 0 out of 10, do you recommend caffeine to be continued until 40 weeks um, of the gestational age, or can it be discontinued? So the latest um, information from the manufacturer is that they, because of this improvement on neuromuscular development and gross motor development, um, it would be beneficial to, to actually keep the baby on it until discharge or just prior to discharge because of the muscular development that goes with it. Now, um, I think that we have sufficient time for me to explain to you um, one of the biggest problems with regards to neonates or to preemies in the intensive care. If we are not flexing these babies sufficiently and giving and 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 um, swaddling these babies and creating a, a, a substitute uterus, the muscle development in these babies is weak, and so they present later on diagnosed as something that we call low tone, and that makes it very difficult to get these children to A, crawl correctly, and B, walk correctly. Your ability to crawl correctly and your ability to walk correctly is directly linked to your access of higher function. So previously, we used to say, well, it's linked to your, your, your mathematical skill. Well, yes, it is, but actually, it indicates your higher functioning. So the, the correct use and the um, proper use of language, the ability to write um, an essay or something, and the ability to do maths and science is all higher function in the brain. And so it becomes extremely important that when we've got these babies that have got to 34 weeks and they're now sort of ready and that we start paying a lot of attention to their, to their development. And caffeine, fortunately, stimulates and allows for that pathway to be created from muscle on the outside into the brain where the pathway originates. Now, a normal term baby generally functions this way. They will do something almost by mistake. So they will be lying in tummy time on, 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 on the floor and they will by mistake touch um, the ball and pull the ball towards them. And now they realize, oh, if I do, if I make this movement, so pulling the ball towards me, that brings me something. For the preem infant, you almost have to stimulate the pathway in the brain and repeatedly stimulate it to get that muscle memory, so pull the ball towards me. And this is where caffeine has shown that it allows these children gross motor control. And if they've got gross motor control, they are more likely to explore the world. If you don't have good motor, gross motor control and you're sort of unstable on your feet, as, as a baby, that makes exploration difficult. If you have good control over your muscles and you can walk quite confidently, they explore easier. And that's why the research is showing it and why we are now saying perhaps we should leave 
the caffeine there longer. It's a long explanation, but I hope it helps. Excellent, Linda. Thank you so much. Um, we have not received any more questions, but I think Linda has shared a lot of resources and also a direct link to a few um, organizations from which you can also get further information. And of course, if you do get questions after the webinar, um, you can always contact Linda or our Dragger Academy and we will forward your um, questions to Linda directly. So if there are no more questions, thank you very much for attending the webinar today. And we would highly um, appreciate if you could provide your feedback after the webinar on the further topics that um, you would like to listen about and also on um, further improvements that we can implement. So Linda, thank you again for your excellent lectures, for sharing your expertise with us and our participants. And we will reconnect back in November for the um, endocrine system module. Thank you everyone and have a great day.